Hi, Alice. Hi, Charles. So, let's get started. You're ready? Yes. It begins with the performance of getting onto the stage. So let's just talk about that for a second, all right? So part of what I do is I'm an artist, I'm a dancer and choreographer, and I make work um, using my body uh, in discussion with the relationship of disability, technology, and design. I use ramps and an ideas as ways of setting that up. So uh, how many of you uh, felt okay about, did you watch us come up on the lift? Did you turn away? Anyone feel embarrassed to see us come up on the lift? There's something funny, but yet there was a sort of smattering of applause about it. Right, so there's a recognition, right? I mean, I'm a dancer. I am ready for stage at any point, and I'm always ready for some applause, bring it on. However, right, the act of entering a stage is, is, is also kind of um, interesting. You know, when you think about the energy of coming onto a stage, speakers have leapt onto the stage to a smattering amount of applause, whereas the entrance is thinking about, like, you know, Charles came up, and Charles came up in solidarity using the lift, thank you, but he shouldn't have had to come up in solidarity using the lift. What would have happened if the world had been structured, or the, if the design had been structured in such a way that Charles and I could have entered equitably on along the same kind of pathway as other speakers, and the same kind of energy, and the same kind of force, and vibration, and life that the other speakers in the conference bring. So the question is raised by the performance of the design. Yeah, it's a little awkward, but it's not awkward for Hub Week. It's more about a change maker conference. It's more awkward about thinking, this design, this technology, this entrance prompts us to think about how we value bodies and think about bodies in the course of design, in the course of humanity, and that gets us thinking about how do we value bodies and disabled people in our world. So that's where we're gonna go. This is the frame, this is the setup for some of this. Um, I have slides. On screen is an image of me in my wheelchair um, on one of my ramps. I am diving headfirst over the ramp. Screen on the text says Alice Shepherd, aliceshepherd.com. Um, this is a conversation, so we will not necessarily be proceeding in linear order, though the slides are um, set up in linear order. So if, if we get to a conversation, Charles, and I feel like I've got a slide for that, you're just going to hear me say, I've got a slide for that. And we'll flip forward and backwards in the conversation as it goes. Does that make sense to everybody? Are we all sort of situated? And um, as we go, I will always describe any image of video because it's modeling part of accessible presentation style. That is, you don't know who's in the room. And um, part of what access means is to make material consistently and equitably available across all uh, mediums. So I will be describing my slides if and when I use them. Cool. Excellent. So part of my gig, uh, I am also a theater person. I don't really have a, a problem being center stage, and I can find my light. <laughs> um, but my gig now uh, mm -hmm. with the state is one to really talk uh, and help cultural organizations in the arena understand human variety and its very mm -hmm. regularity in its mm -hmm. vast variety. Um, and. People are always, and there's certainly notions in this room today, about how technology can support people, uh, to serve people. Um, and in that context, Alice, how mm. do you feel about that phrase, um, technology serving people with disabilities? Ooh, right, complicated. Um, I just went right for it. Yeah, you did, right? So we're right we got in it. We got 30 minutes. <laughs> we got 30 minutes. So um, I, you know, I want to walk a fine line with you, and, and then I want to like jump over the line into the deep end. Here's me jumping, and we'll go back to the fine line at the end. What if we said technology did not serve people with disabilities, right? What if we said the point of technology is to actually, if you, if you could design not to normalize disability, not to bridge the gap between normative bodies, normative ideas of who is a citizen and how what citizen participation means, what if you actually designed uh, technology to maximize the expression of your impairment? So, so for me, the example that I would use for that is, 
and, and I, I do use ramps for this, and um, we've been hashtagging it under the hashtag ramp joy, but what if you could actually think about every slope and every gradient as an example, as an opportunity for real joy, every ramp? What would that mean? And so I think there's a way in which you could have slopes and ramps designed to maximize the feeling of whooshing down the hill. Um, and, and, the, and the pleasure of coming back up the hill. And I do actually have a slide for that. So we're just gonna like page on through and wait until we hit the right design here. Uh-huh, uh -huh. no. There we go. Uh-huh, uh -huh. yes. so on screen. Image of me in my chair. Slowly moving towards the ramp. Lit in a white pathway as I hit the ramp and it grab its edge and just dive straight for the edge because that's what you do with ramps. They're fun to do that with, um, right? But 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 no, I mean it is fun and the idea that that is actually an amusing moment is an opportunity for design and technological imagination. We are so focused on designing to get into the space but not on how we get into the space. The equity of the experience, the equity of enjoying that moment of being on the ramp. On screen is an image of me in the Guggenheim Museum, and you know, this is not an ADA compliance design ramp. It is not, but it's one of the most gorgeous ramps I've ever been on. Um, and it is, you know, it is like the ramp in the high, it's like the ramp at the Neomoya um, ex uh, Museum in, um, in Rio de Janeiro. These are architectural features designed for the pleasure of the user. On the right hand side of the screen is a wheelchair access ramp. Oh. Right. <laughs> right? So how do we get from this beautiful architectural design to this access ramp, which is an ugly metal texted piece slung across the building into a courtyard, clearly an accommodation, and a retroactive, a, a retrofitting. Um, you know, the thing I say about this ramp is, would you kiss your lover on that? <laughs> no! Would you? I love that. <laughs> right? Right? But, but the, 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 we get from there to here to there by thinking about this is designed for disability. That ramp could be different. That ramp could not have been there in the first place. Well, and doesn't that then tie into the challenge for designers? Uh, this, rather than um, mere compliance, uh, but rather the aesthetics of creating things that all of us can enjoy, rather than the stamp of, oh, this is the wheelchair entrance versus this is the ramped entrance. Yeah, love it. Right, so we know from other contexts that separate is not equal. Um, and so we've worked this out at Brown B. Board of Education. We know in, in New York, I don't know if you've been following, there's this recent debate about rich doors and poor doors in apartment construction. Um, and, and yet, and so, you know, finally we've managed to get to a place where, in fact, we decided that's not a good idea. But, and yet, we continue to design separate but equal and not equal entrances for people with disabilities. So what is that? What is that saying about our values? What is that saying about the actual understanding of who we think we are as a culture? I'm not sure, you know, it, it's, it's almost like the user should be grateful to be able to get in, but that's not quite where we are. So yeah, I think it is a challenge. It's a challenge between functionality and and actual equitable experience. I love to tell the story of Michael Graves, who woke up in his rehab um, unit. For those of you who don't know Michael Graves, he's a really, uh, he was an incredible award-winning designer and architect who became disabled late in his life and went on to design several interesting projects for people with disabilities, uh, wheelchairs, et cetera, there's a walker, there's a bar stool. For him, he woke up in his rehab unit and one of his first thoughts is, it's too ugly to die here. Right, but think about that. Uh, if you were here this morning when Dr. Diana Walker was talking about the relationship of, of building and architecture and design, Michael Ray's rakes up in a rehab unit, figures out it's too ugly to die here. When he tries to use, this is, an, this is a hospital setting, right? When he tries to use the shaver outlet and reach the, the taps or the, turn the, sink, the water on, it's set for somebody who is uh, caring for him, but not for him to be able to reach and use it on his own. The design of the use says a lot about the expected user. 
and the design for people with disabilities is caught in this dialectic between functionality, this uh, te technology should, this is a long answer, right? Technology should serve people with disabilities and actually the experience of, of, of users doing it. And so we wanna get to a place where we are designing not necessarily for serving, but also not necessarily for um, overcoming the gap of by normalizing and curing disability by erasing it in the future. So that's, a, that's a, an avenue to follow up on. But let's look a little, dig a little deeper into the idea of, of normalizing. I think that, um, that for, for some folks in the room, for certainly uh, Boston itself with its academic background, its big medical background, that there's a, a diagnosis that we want to put on to disability. Right. Uh, because um, with a little technology, uh, we could, on lack of a better phrase, fix you. Mm. <laughs> I wish you could, <laughs> right? So, so let me just ask you this, or maybe I should ask you this, uh, and don't, don't answer the question, but how many of you wondered what my diagnosis was, or what happened to me, or what's wrong with me? And um, you know, I wanna be able to begin to think about disability, and here we go. As an artist, right, I want to say to you, and to you, that disability is not the deficit of diagnosis. Um, and I think that's because culturally, we frame disability as being the opposite of ability, right? So you are, and people use words like abled um, or disabled. And then when I hear the word abled, I always like, well, what is their superpower that they've been added to that they've somehow been abled versus my disabled? And has my superpower been disabled? No, it's, it is the opposite of disabled for me is non-disabled. And, and, and you know that, that's an important moment because it means that we're looking at centering not the diagnosis but what disability might be as an aesthetic and as a culture. So, you know, and, and that's a complicated thing to say when clearly there is a medical diagnosis at issue. The question for me becomes when there is a diagnosis, what is the societal and cultural and aesthetic values that are out there about living with that diagnosis. And if we shift from focusing on the medicalization of the body to the aesthetic part of the body, and, and by, which, by what, which body I mean, all of this is my body. My wheelchair is not an extension of the body. My wheelchair actually is my body. And so that becomes a whole different thing. It's not a technology, it, it's not a device, it's not a prop. It is a moving, glorious, integrated, sexy part of my body. And you can make art from that. You can't make art from understanding a medical diagnosis in the way that I believe will change the world. So there we go. So then in, in, in that context is uh, when we talk about disability, when we talk about ability or, or ability, our language seems limited. I mean, where do we go? Part of the, the theme of today is shared language. Mm -hmm. So how do we define our, our variety, our humanity, mm. and uh, recognize that we do come in many different sizes, shapes, abilities, colors, um, widths, and how do we reconcile? Right, so. On your, um, on your uh, sort of schedule, this is also gonna be a long answer, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm ready, You're we're ready. all ready. We're ready, okay, we got it. So on the, on the little schedule summary of what this session's about, it, it talks about disability conservation. And in many ways, what I'm not talking about is disability con conservation. That is a very limited field that is dedicated and a specialized term used for um, bioethics, coined by Rosemary Garland Thompson. But I am talking about my practice, which is an idea of an example of disability conservation. So that's Rosemary Garland Thompson's term. Disability, how do we deal with this? What is this? How do we accommodate, think about human variation? Um, well, you know, there are some slides for that as well. Amazing. Right, let's um, go to the end for a second. This is um, 
a section of my dance work on the ramp, and you, um, I'm sliding down a ramp, diving onto from my wheelchair to touch my partner. My partner is underneath me. I'm diving on top of her, and I'm going to drag her across the stage. Um, she's upside down, and her back is on the floor. We're going to come down the ramp and then leap to the peak. This is how we begin thinking through um, how we accommodate difference. We don't accommodate it. Um, and you know, this is a moment where I just want to like, like, what does that mean, right? Think just for a moment. If we think about accommodation, if you came to me, and um, I, and I said I will accommodate you, I, in some ways I'm extending myself to you. I don't know. Do you feel great about that? Not particularly. Um, right. So I want to work as an artist, and I want to ask you what it would mean not to accommodate or think about inclusion. For the moment that you start thinking about inclusion, as Sarah Ahmed points out, you're pointing out that somebody is not at home, that somebody has to extend themselves to, the, to you, to welcome you, to include you. You're almost reinforcing the power dynamic. So um, what happens if you assume equity? And on screen is an image of me in my wheelchair um, and my crutches, and I'm both holding the wheelchair and the crutches together and crossing the crutches in front of my body, looking nervously behind me at the idea of assuming equity. What does it mean to assume equity? Can we work with that? And when, what happens when we make art from that? That would have mean, I think, yes, you would have to have technology that works, right? I have an amazing wheelchair that has gone through a lot of design. It's not the E&J hospital wheelchairs. It's not the airport wheelchairs. And it is not the be all and end all in wheelchairs. There are other designs that are coming forward that are going to be 3D printed to the individual user that will be like modular. But it is that we have functional technology. But with the functional technology, we are able to grow, integrate, make art from the idea that even though there is difference, difference is not necessarily stigmatized. It's recognized, welcomed, and integrated into the system. And that always resonates with me, because I certainly, uh, certainly with my job and in my personal life, the idea that I am different and still want equity that so much of the, of the movement is we're just like you, so we deserve equity, and I celebrate, I'm not like you, but I still want it. Now, um, <laughs> that was just my little uh, podium speech, but um, you also have a hashtag that I really like, that is joy equity. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if, for example, the clicker will take me backwards. So let's just take a little experiment. In theory, it does. The idea of joy equity is that you can look for and experience the pleasure of being in the world together, moving in the world together, and really thinking through that sort of simultaneity of experience uh, to highlight pleasure. So let's break it down. Why joy, why pleasure? And so the first thing is, how many of you think of disabled people as experiencing joy, not just in their lives, but in the actual signs of their impairment? Right? So that's, a, that's an idea. Like, I take tremendous joy in using my wheelchair. And there is a tremendous joy in my body. And there's a tremendous happiness that I experience while dancing. And that, that joy equity is available uh, you know, as a kind of way of being in the world and a way of relating to you in the world. So when I think about using the ramp, um, I want to be able to experience, um, there's a wonderful uh, friend, colleague, Simi Linton, usually describes this by saying, where are the wheelchair access ramps? And when we, when, you know, and almost every wheelchair user will tell you the access ramp is behind a wall, hidden behind the plantings, which are gorgeous, by the way, but it's hidden behind the plantings. Um, it's hidden behind a fence. My favorite restaurant in San Francisco has a beautiful courtyard, and you go into the courtyard and a staircase up to the restaurant. The wheelchair accessible entrance is, tw is behind a 12-foot fence. There's no equity and joy to is the courtyard to actually go there. But also, I don't have any joy with my friends. 
right? My friends go up the stairs because they don't want to go behind the fence. They don't want to go to the back of the dumpster where the wheelchair access entrance is. The number of restaurants and um, bars I've entered through the kitchen. You know, this, the idea of joy equity is simply through thinking through what does it mean to be able to have equitable experience of pleasure and to have that pleasure not just recognized, acknowledged, but planned for, right? Plan, design, think through that pleasure. On screen is an image of me, actually three images of me diving downhill on a ramp in the first one. <laughs> In the first one, I'm lit by pink light. There is pink light at my hair tips, and my arms are just flying out behind me. In the second one on the right, I am crawling backwards on all fours up the ramp, because the ramp is not just about the down, it's also about the up. And in the third one, I am literally hanging at the point of suspension with my arms raised in the, in the air. If you push hard enough up a ramp, there is that moment where you are just hanging utterly still, if you nail it, as a dancer, you can push right up and hang before gravity and momentum takes you down. Can I do an imaginative exercise with you for a second? All right, cool. Um, just for a second, bring yourselves to a well-balanced position, wherever you are in your body. Bring yourselves to a well, what you imagine is a well-balanced position. Love you all. You all sat up straight. <laughs> um, so can I, let me ask you to investigate that. Does straight actually mean well-balanced for you? So shift around a bit. Maybe, maybe well-balanced is not like... <gasps> find a place where you could actually breathe. Go with me for a second. Close your eyes. Imagine or remember yourself at the top of a hill... Imagine or remember yourself on your roller skates, your bike, your skateboard, um, maybe even skis. Imagine yourself at the top of that hill in your wheelchair. Imagine the emptiness in front of you. And then put your hands to your wheels, push down with your arms, push down with your um, ski pushing off things, forget what they're called, and fly. Hang there in that moment of flight. That moment is what I use to make art from. You can all open your eyes. I mean, you're all like halfway down the hill now. But you know what I mean? That there's a way in which that imagination, the freedom of your body in flight, that is at the core of joy equity. And that is something that can be enhanced by disability and design and technology. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. Well, actually, thank yourselves. I mean, you did the, you did the exercise. So uh, here we are at Hub Week. Um, we're at Hub Week. We're talking about technology, centering the artist. Um, people have different ideas of what an artist might be. Um, but I'm going to ask something that's a little off my agenda, but Ooh. not too much. Mm -hmm. But why choreography? Why movement? Right. Um, yeah, it's kind of odd, right? Um, because, you know, I come to you as a dancer, and, and maybe one question is, Ooh, what does dance tell me about, you know, if you think about dance, I don't know how many of you go to dance. Is it that elite art form where people prance around the stage in, in point shoes? Mm. Why me? Why dance? What does dance tell you? You know, well, dance is an art form of the body. It is an art form of movement. And there, so there are two things I want to say is that movement is the essential. It, it, it's, it's like the invisible thing that is predicated in all city design, in the way we are in the world. I mean, it's part of the American national identity that each generation will be moving, that there's a notion of mobility, that it is tied maybe to physical mobility, to transportation mobility, to aspirational mobility. And dance is a way of accessing those ideas and transforming them and questioning them and putting them on stage so that we can transform, question, and access them. But also, you know, damn it, Dance is an art form of the body, and there is nothing more luscious than reaching into your body, pushing onto the stage, and beginning to move. And I do think of um, what you do, and I've spent a lot of time on 
alisheppard.com. <laughs> That was a little plug. But uh, I do think of what you're, you're doing as an artist and as a performer, the idea of bringing people together, creating an environment on the stage as a form of communication that is different than just being up on stage talking. And yeah. so I want to be able to get there. I have a slide for this. <laughs> um. <laughs> um, so this is really important. Access technology is often thought of a, as a retroactive um, a fitting a, a, a accommodation, right? You do it, you make it accessible. You do it, there's a technology that will make it accessible. In my work, access is the aesthetic. It is a way of being and relating with each other. It is a way of moving in the world. It is a way of, uh, it's a process, not a product. And these are ideas coming from the disability justice groups, uh, from Sins Invalid and from Mia Mingus. And so there is a way in which access is not something you just press a button on or pick an app for. It is a way of connecting me to you so that we can move through the world together, experience art together on an equitable basis. And so I actually want to think about that notion of you know, the, of the, ramp, the ugly ramp or the, the integration of community so that dance is a movement art, but it's a movement art that connects me to you to you because now we are connected around the col uh, collaborative ideas through an aesthetic experience. It is a way of being in community because community is accessible and community is accountable. And so these are, these are the ways in which I think about us moving together. We are, you know, it's a kind of a, a, a joke, but people say that this is a, a life, as, life as a dance. Well, yes, but maybe life is actually about finding movement, building movement, connecting movement in a way that people can be part integrated into it equally, if not differently, so that, that, that they go together. Um, and I'm gonna say on screen, um, and stay in touch. So to find out more about Ramp uh, Joy, Joy Equity, and also our, our sister hashtag Ramp Fail, um, you can. Well, you know, it's a hashtag. If you go to if you go to Twitter and look at the hashtag Ramp Fail, you will find people posting issues, pictures of Ramp Fail all the way from across the world. So you can join me with um, on Twitter. Or um, if you text RAMP, to the word RAMP, R-A-M-P, to 66866, you'll get a link um, to an essay about RAMP fail, joy, equity, and some of the ideas and some of the movement that's going on there. Um, so that's, that's how we are connected around the words of access being an idea and a community of ideas that share, uh, we can share and then pass on. And this does feed into what we've been talking about today, the idea of community being uh, redefined so that it can exist in different spaces. Uh, it exists here in this room. It exists in a theater or an environment where you put on mm -hmm. a performance. Mm -hmm. It can exist in the Twitter sphere and various other online. Because I know that I follow certain heroes that I have mm -hmm. on Twitter, and that kind of leadership is different now. You know, I've never met so. Alice Wong, but I'm a huge fan. Right, right. And so this is how we create that community. Te I mean, you hear people say te technology is democratizing, but the technology is only democratizing is it is also accessible and usable by all. And so if you are a designer and a technologist, I would, I would ask you to think deeply about the, the conversation, the tension even between functionality and actual joy, equity of experience and of use. So that your access becomes not something that you do because it's federally mandated, but it's something that you do because it is the right thing to do and it connects us in a way to being humans and citizens of this world together. Because we are already humans and we are already here. Oh, I'm going to let you, you that's, so that sounds like a good last word to me. <laughs> well, you know, I try to wrap it on up. So, <laughs> well, thank um, you, Joe. Alice, thank you for joining me on the stage. And thank you, everyone, for being a part mm -hmm. of this today. Thank you. Thank you.